Ahead I saw a cottage from which hung a post office sign. I raced for it, seeing from the corner of my eye a monstrous shadow moving jerkily through the gloom. My voice rang out into silence as I burst into the building. Hello! Anyone home? Silence, as oppressive as the darkness. Now it seemed that I was alone in the village. With the lamp casting shadows that leapt crazily up the walls, I searched the post office until I found the room that served as the radio cabin. Here I sat myself before the small set and switched it on. Seconds later, valves glowed yellow through the ventilation slots. Something tapped at the open window above my head. Using the radio set's braille instruction booklet as a makeshift shield to guard my face, I jumped up at the window, shoved it shut, then locked it. Now at last I could make that call for help. I pressed the transmit button. Hello, this is an emergency transmission on frequency 9. Emergency HQ Newport. Do you read me? Over. For a moment I was convinced I'd received no reply. Already I was too late. The island had been overrun. I tried again, tension making my voice sound higher. Emergency HQ, Newport. Hello, do you read me? Over. Caller on frequency 9. We read you. Please stay off the air. Weariness permeated the radio operator's tones. It sounded as if he'd had a long night. But I need to report an emergency. Over. The darkness? Oh yes, thank you caller, we know all about that. The man had clearly written me off as a dimwit. Now, I'm waiting for a number of fire reports. I have to keep this frequency clear, so caller, please go off air. Over. Good grief, you can't be serious! I shouted, forgetting on-air etiquette. Sir, I appreciate you must be anxious about the darkness. The official line is to stay put. It's probably an unusually dense cloud layer that has obscured the sun. So kindly switch off. No! Listen to me. I have something else to report. Over. Go ahead, caller, came the voice reluctantly. My name is David Mason, calling from Bikewater. I wish to report a tripid incursion. There was a pause. Static crackled on the ether. At last, HQ responded in a voice that came close to stunned disbelief. Say again, Mr. Mason. It sounded as if you used the word Triffid. Over. Something lashed against the window. You heard correctly. And until someone can tell me anything different, I'd say we've just been invaded. The Night of the Triffids by Simon Clark, read by Stephen Pacey. Prologue. It is now 25 years since 300 men, women and children withdrew from the British mainland to establish a colony of survivors on the Isle of Wight. There, in every library and in every school, is a mimeographed typescript of William Mason's account of the Great Blinding, the coming of the Triffids, and the fall of civilization. Comprising little more than 200 quarto pages, it is bound between covers of stiff orange card. Inside, you will find no illustrations and not so much as a single photograph. It is a vivid enough story, nonetheless. This is the final paragraph of William Mason's book. So we must regard the task ahead as ours alone. We think now that we can see the way, but there is still a lot of work and research to be done before the day when we, or our children, or their children, will cross the narrow straits on the great crusade to drive the Triffids back and back with ceaseless destruction until we have wiped the last one of them from the face of the land that they have usurped. That is the end of William Mason's testament. What follows now is the beginning of another in a world that still lies in thrall to the dreadful Triffid.